All right, folks, we've got a wonderful show today. We are doing Q&A. We're answering your questions and we're covering questions like Queensland land tax. How do we confirm that it's off the table? Also, out-of-pocket expenses. When is it too much and when should I sell? Ben, what else are we covering? Bryce, we've got other great questions around investment loans. Should I pay them off? Big question mark. And then finally, it's about a great question from Kay around act now or act later. Mm, ben, and I think you've got someone else in the gun too. I do, mate. I've got someone else in Queensland in the gun again. They're making silly decisions for us property investors. So more to share about that in what's making property news. All right, stick around, folks. Let's get straight into the show now. Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel. Co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory. Named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. All right, mate, welcome back to the Property Couch Podcast. Welcome back to you. How are you? Good, mate. You? Very good. Very good. Hey, we had a big, significant upgrade that we feel like will benefit our community, Ben. I think um, I think we should I think we should talk about this. Well, obviously, we're very passionate about money smarts and helping people organise their finances. And of course, with interest rates going up, money management now becomes the main focus for some. We've got a whole summer series on that, so you're going to hear plenty about that. But I just wanted to let everyone know that yes, we had a, a, a very good upgrade to our more platform and some of the interesting things that we've done. I'll just quickly read through them. So we've now got a brand new My Goal section, Bryce. Mm -hmm. And this, how we design our My Goal section is really about setting dates. If there's a financial element to it, put the financial target next to it and also that combination. And then you can also achieve those. You've got stamps for achievement. So check out the brand new My Goal section that we put in there. You'll also see some changes for those who are familiar with it, um, we've now introduced a naming categorization that goes in with all of the uh, categories. So expense items, you'll now have a name for. Now, there's some exciting things happening there. Um, that's sort of just a, a first step in the dance in terms of what we're going to be doing around those naming categories and some of the insights and new dashboards that we're going to build as part of that as well. So there is other things there, you'll start to see a little sneak peek of Opti, who's the smart assistant that's also being built in there as well. Yeah. Um, so there's plenty of new things that are also happening in there. So um, check it out is, is what I'm saying. So for those of you that are new to our community, you think, what is he talking about? It's <laughs> uh, We've written a book called Make Money Simple Again. It has a Money Smarts program in it that shows you how to manage your money in 10 minutes a month or less. And so, Ben, it's a nice little evolution. It's helpful to share the journey along the way because it used to be sort of in a little uh, pencil and journal, then it became a an Excel spreadsheet, and then yep. it became uh, we we put the Excel spreadsheet up onto the cloud, Ben, and then that cloud was a bit clunky, and um, it served its purpose at the time, but then it's been evolved to help people, and then we introduced it onto the property couch and said, hey, look, it's free, and go and use it. And this is going to help you if you read the book instead of having to have many spreadsheets, and. So now it's just another evolution of growing up, right? From way back when it was a pencil and an eraser um, through to the spreadsheet through to what it is now. It's had a significant um, user experience upgrade in preparation, Ben, in preparation for what everyone's been screaming out for, Ben. <laughs> but it's important. I think it's good to set the scene for what it's yeah. what's actually coming next. Yeah, well, with, you know, both Android and Apple environments, you've got to lodge your mobile apps and so they've got to be approved and tested and so forth. So that's where we're at now. We're at the stage of getting those lodgements done this week. And then as soon as we have those approvals, um, hopefully by the end of this month, <gasps> hopefully, you know, hopefully by the end of this month, <laughs> we will be able to also announce the uh, the mobile version as well. So uh, stick around for that big announcement when it hopefully can hit by the end of this month, touch wood, all going well. Now, folks, we're excited for you, but let's be honest, it's just as exciting for us, Ben, because we use the system we talk about. Yeah, uh, It's not something that other people should use and we don't use. It's the system that we use to manage uh, our money in less than 10 minutes a month. And all of a sudden, it's going to be on our little personalized pocket-sized computer, Ben, our little <laughs> smartphone. It'll be with um, us everywhere. 
which means that um, the number one friction point, the number one pain point that people were experiencing is they have to use money smarts on a desktop, but they need it to be mobile. That's coming very, very shortly. So what I want to say to anyone who's listening to this, you've been around for a long time. You're already using money smarts. Log in, go and see the upgrade. It's pretty cool. It's been organized really intuitively. The team has done a terrific job led by Ben. So go and check it out. For those of you who've been listening to us for a long time and you're not a money smarts user, oh, what are you waiting for? Go to makemoneysimpleagain.com.au, download the book. On the second page of downloading the book, we'll actually show you how to get access to more, Ben, so that you can implement the details from the book. And if you're new to the community, we want to encourage you. There's a summer series coming up. You're going to hear stories of people who have actually transformed the way that they manage their money uh, through using this very simple system that is automated for you. And for everyone who's listening, the mobile app is coming. It is coming. You heard it here. It is coming. That will benefit us all enormously yeah. as we can manage. Now, uh, just a little side note, Ben. It's not another money management app um, more, M O O R. It's actually a lifestyle by design app that has money management as part of it because people have got goals. They've got other things that they need to do as part of fulfilling uh, lifestyle by design, which is what we are all about. Um, so it's if you if you just think oh gosh here's another money management it's more than that it's um it's four big pillars Bryce four big pillars mm. my goals money wealth and property I mean we are a property um, you know property is the vehicle in which we help people create wealth and build wealthier tomorrows and that financial peace story that we're talking about so we have some awesome property data also coming through. Um, over the next couple of months and years as well. We've got we've got a product pathway for a lifestyle by design app that brings all the big elements um, of your life. So you can design it and then try and implement it. And a lot of behavioral aspects to that as well in terms of trying to allow you to take action or see, see your blind spots. You know, I've, I've talked before on this podcast about consequential finance. Mm -hmm. um, that is going to play a big role in terms of making people problem aware um, as well. So we've got some unbelievable things just over the horizon um, in terms of what we're going to try and introduce to our community to help them obviously transform their, their themselves into building uh, better financial outcomes. We can help anyone who has money management flowing through their house, Ben, but we're going our property investors, helping them yeah. make it simple, make it easy. Um, so if you're a property investor, you're not using that, you should check it out. It's free, folks. It's free if that point was missed. Hey, Ben, call logic data. Yeah, so Bryce, obviously um, in the RBA and economic update that I give, I also like to spend a fair bit of time on talking about the core logic or the data that's come out in terms of the performance of the last month. And remember, when we are talking about the last month, we're not getting ourselves too over overwhelmed with the short term. We are playing a longer term game, but people do like to, to hear the story of what's actually happening in the property space. And the themes are continuing, even though we've had six months of declining values more broadly across the Australian property sector, we are definitely seeing that there's a, a slowing of pace in our two bigger markets of Sydney and Melbourne, and then Brisbane's pace has actually creeped up a bit, but also remembering it had a, a better overall performance, so it's giving a back uh, a bit of that, uh, that performance. We suspect that that's going to continue for a couple more months as the cash rate still finds its uh, its sort of final uh, resting place for a while. Um, so we would expect to see, you know, sort of more broadly across these bigger market segments that, that the prices are going to retract a little bit. What is interesting, though, is, you know, there is obviously some data showing that there are pockets of markets, inside markets that are actually growing in value. So that's always something that people uh, tend to miss. And certainly from a mainstream media point of view, uh, they don't necessarily <laughs> talk about. But we did see, I'll just quickly wrap them up. Sydney, 1.3% down. Melbourne, 0.8% down. Sydney, 2% down. Adelaide, 0.3% of 1%. Perth, 0.2% of 1%. Hobart, 1.1%. Darwin down 0.8 and Canberra down one. So the, the combined capitals was down 1.1. Combined regionals was down 1.4. Overall national combined was down 1.2. Um, so that just gives you some idea. Now, we will we will sort of see the end of the year out and, and coming after the summer series, we'll spend a fair bit of time in February just resetting the story around the outlook for the new, um, the new property year. Um, that's going to be informed by what's basically happened from consumer spending. Um, as per my economic update, 
I did talk heavily about the fact that um, if we continue to keep spending, um, inflation will still be our challenge. And so we do need to have this manufacturer slow down. And if we all contribute to slowing down the economy or, or again, reducing our discretionary spending and on our essential spending, looking at substitution goods, um, that which, which really does send a strong signal to businesses that they can't keep racking the prices up on us, um, that is going to play an important role in reducing demand-led inflation, um, which will obviously play an important role of keeping the cash rate lower. So that's the that's the broader message here. Ben, to your point too, I just want to I want to land the headline with the on the ground too, because when we talk to our team or on the ground, um, there isn't a lot of stock available yeah. in the types of property that we want to buy. Um, so I think that can be a, a, a challenging message for some because they they hear at the headline level everything that's that's negative, and then the actual um, coalface stuff is different. So what I'd want you to do is if you if you're talking to your advisor or you've got a a buyer's agent or, you know, not just ours, Ben, anyone out in the marketplace, um, just have a chat about what's going on in the market that you're targeting because um, headlines have to be at a very high level. Um, but there isn't a lot of stock there of the stuff that is coming up. There's competition yeah. of the stuff that is available that has competition, isn't seeing um, price drops. Um, so I think there's a reconciliation that is needed. And, and to, the point that we want to say is if um, there is always somewhere that's growing, right? Yeah. Even even despite that, if the if the sentiment is down, there are certain pockets that are growing, and uh, we know that that's what we're using all of our data and insight and research we do in house to find those spots that are growing, um, and also jockeying for position to get the assets that you want to actually enjoy in the next sort of 10, 15 years as well. Because um, the biggest question people go is now really the right time to buy anyway based on the fact that they're picking up every headline. So yeah. for those of you that are that are not new to the game or you've got that, you can see past that, I'd certainly encourage you to lean in and talk to the people who are actually at the coalface to get a to get that reconciliation point between the headlines and what's really going on. Yeah, and it reinforced that message that I had at the end of the, uh, the property section of the update around the anecdotal stuff that we're seeing, what our buyers agents are. So you just, you know, basically reminded the community of exactly what I said on the on the update. So that's always important um, to to move through. But thanks for the opportunity to sort of just share that uh, that data with everyone. We'll put the table inside the show notes, like we always do. Um, and thanks to our good friends at Core Logic for allowing us to uh, to share this latest data. We'll take a more of a deeper in depth look at it in December, and also um, setting up for a, a big deep dive in February as well. Great job. And for those of you that, that haven't listened to Ben's update, it is in your podcast feed. Go and have a little listen to that um, and uh, get uh, some of the detail Ben's talking about. Hey, Ben, a little while ago, we caught up uh, with Twee when we did a Should You Use a Buyer's Agent um, series two-parter. He was on the back end of the second episode and we talked about why you should use a uh, a buyer's agent. He gave his experience. Now, you rewind a little earlier. He was in the summer series talking about um, how he's used money smarts and all those sorts of things. So he's a a big friend of the podcast. We've loved uh, watching their family's journey to financial freedom, financial peace. He recently reached out to you and me uh, via email, and uh, I'm going to read what uh, what he said to us. Hi, Bryce and Ben. Just a quick note to let you know that after listening to episode 406, How to Beat the Banks at Their Own Game, I reached out to Luke. Um, he's one of our investment savvy mortgage brokers and started the discussions around tactics we could use to get the sharpest rates with our current bank. was happy to find out on Friday that the bank is giving me 2.39% discount on our PPOR loan, 2.82% discount on all our investment loans, plus $4,000 retention cash. This was after about two to three weeks worth of follow-ups and negotiations. Winning. Thanks for that episode and thanks to Luke for the support. Now, Ben, I have since read a big backstory on what's going on there, and I and I watched the exchange, thanks to Twee letting me know, talk to the retention team, what am I going to do? <laughs> they said no to giving him um, the money for the retention. Thanks for that, but would you like to lock us in? And it was actually uh, wor well worth um, his effort because he's not only yeah. knocked off some, some money, but also ended up did negotiating, ended up did, how bad is that, ended up getting uh, yes. the retention cash. So, the reason we tell this story, Ben, is because there's a couple of things. You've done a Beat the Banks series on video. We did a Beat the Banks podcast. Um, it wasn't theory. It was it was practical ways that you could save um, some money. So I just wanted to encourage our community and let them know that 
someone's doing it, listening to the stuff, putting it into place. And so in this case, um, our team guided them, mentored uh, Twee through what to say, how to respond to the emails, make sure that you dig in. And that's um, that's the value of having someone in your corner that's helping you out. So uh, very good, Twee. Well done. Thanks for letting me share that with the community. And hopefully everyone else goes back and implements some of that stuff themselves, Ben. Yeah. And if they want to check out that How to Beat the Banks series as part of our Not Leaving Money on the Table More series, we'll put the link in the show notes as well, um, because obviously you can cut straight to that. There's um, lots of videos in there about some of the, you know, how the system works, how the game you, you need to play and how you can beat the banks at their own game. So ultimately, you know, that's why we put that information up there. We're passionate about helping those people who um, uh, effectively have mortgages that could be sharper um, mm-hmm. and are leaving money on the table. Um, so check that series out at your leisure. Get the money back in your pocket, folks. Put it in your offset accounts, your money. Use it better. Use it wider. Okay, my mindset minute theme today, Ben, is uh, it's a Donald Miller quote. I like Donald Miller. I uh, wrote a couple of books. One is um, uh, Building a Story Brand. It teaches you the seven steps of of any story Um that Star Wars has done, any Hollywood movie, you know, it's the, effectively the hero's journey. I loved it. But he says super successful people are often just normal folks who got very curious about something and they chased that curiosity. Mm. I, I think that's really worth remembering because there's quite often people look up and they see successful people and think that there's something different about them and it, it's not. They usually just do the basics and they relentlessly chase those basics and learn how to scale the basics. Um, there's generally very little complexity in what they do um, because the scale creates the complexity. Um, so, but this one, I just it crossed my path and I thought, mm, super successful people are just off the normal folks who get very curious about something and they chase that curiosity. So you did, Ben. You got curious about it. You chased the curiosity. I did. I got curious, chased the curiosity. Most of the people totally. that we talk to, they just got curious about money management and how to invest their money and uh, risk returns and which is better and where, where can I get the leverage and they just got curious, they chased it, they put some knowledge into action and here they are being very, very successful. So there you go, folks, something for you to think about as you lead into your week. Now, today is Q&A day. We've got some really good questions here. Um, so I'll kick off the first ones emailed into us. Um, and here's the question. It's regarding confirmation that the Queensland land tax is off the table, Ben. <laughs> uh, hi, Ben. Just Ben, there's no one else. I'm a property investor contemplating my next purchase. I heard that due to the lack of support, Queensland's Premier has had to be backtrack on her proposed new land tax, which would see the subjected tax calculated on one's total Australian land holdings in brackets, where before was only based on holdings in Queensland. Yes, that was true. That was the proposal. The reason I'm touching base is the Queensland Premier stated she would have to revoke the proposal and would have to be tabled and passed in Parliament. Not understanding this process, I wondered if you might know whether the proposal has been formally revoked or if you can advise how or where I could direct this inquiry to obtain absolute proof (laughs) this land tax is now off the table. LOL. There is no way I would want to proceed buying in Queensland knowing the new land tax could send me broke. I need to see it set in stone. Thanks for any help you can offer. Behen. (laughs) <laughs> well, thanks for singling me out and saying, you know, thank you. And we've got obviously all of this uh, lobbying work that we did, which did make a difference in terms of it where the Queensland difference. government was at. Now, so what I can tell you is I, I haven't um, exhaustively searched through um, the Queensland Parliament Register for that change, but where I can tell you where you, you need to go, um, and that is when you go and you search for Queensland Parliament, Um, there is a section on their website that says bills before the house. And so any of the information that governments are doing on a day-to-day basis, with a little bit of searching, you will be able to discover the bills and the agenda that is going to be um, happening as part of those house um, actions, right? So you've got lower house and then you've got the Senate. Now, in terms of the actual bill itself, it was included as part of the budget bill um, that was tabled Um, at the end of last year, and then ultimately was passed um, in that sort of, I think it was June, July period, um, where effectively, because it was woven into that budget bill, what they're going to need to do is they're going to need to make an amendment um, to that budget bill and then basically withdraw that um, part of the legislation. So yes, it was legislated. So yes, there is a removal of that. 
there's an area, I'll put a link in the show notes, uh, help the team put a link in the show notes, where it sort of talks about bills before Parliament House in Queensland, um, and ultimately they will be um, re rescinded. Now, um, in terms of to have absolute proof, look, when a politician and a treasurer, when a premier and a treasurer publicly announce a retraction of their statement, um, you, it's almost a fait accompli, right? So obviously there is the paperwork that needs to go behind that, but they will be held to account by all the political reporters and all of the people who uh, who were behind this particular story. So you can you can guarantee that that will definitely happen um, in terms of what's going to happen now. When where the uh, curiosity lies is because um, there's a there's a thing that we refer to in terms of um, you know when you want to successfully navigate the political environment here, right? So, you know, in terms of what they were doing here as a, an off-bridging and an off-boarding, um, and that's where the challenge is because there were some people um, in the Labor Party and potentially in the Greens Party who thought it was a bloody good idea, like, you know, not 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 understanding the economic and social consequences of it, just the short-term look, they thought it was a bloody good idea. So how you do this off-boarding, um, you know, this off-ramping is you say to them, um, when you're making a statement, we're just going to park that idea for a while, right? And and that's sort of the way in which it sort of gives some false hope to the people that it's going to be reintroduced. But for the vast majority of people, that's just basically making sure that it wasn't a harsh offboarding, you know, that you didn't push push the legislation straight off the plank. Um, this one is just basically how you politically manoeuvre to sort of say, well, we've still got that in our, in our, our ideas bucket over here, but it, it probably will never see the light of day again. Um, because it really was, you know, stupid policy. So, you know, from that point of view, I think that's probably the best way to, to describe it. But if we do have time and, and so search through the bill's agenda that's coming up and we find it, we'll give you the direct link. But uh, for those who are curious, um, you know, basically the legislative agenda is included in the parliamentary website and you'll see all the different uh, legislations that are being either repealed or introduced as new bills um, to one day become law. I think the uh, the point about the political manoeuvring is really important to double click on too, because you know if you haven't listened to the conversation we had with uh, the Premier Dom Perrottet, uh, the New South Wales Premier from a few weeks ago, um, talked about how thought it was dumb, wouldn't support it, um, and so it, there was evidence in the lead up to the rescind the public rescind rescinding um, where the Premier was very keen to um, well could see the writing on the wall. Um, that the proposal um, that the that the tax wouldn't work, and so therefore was looking for a political way to step off, right? Of and you talked about off ramping. So she wanted to, um, uh, you know, I'm not quoting direct conversations, but it, you could see that she wanted to step off that pathway. Found it very difficult under under the momentum. So as soon as the other states gave them uh, the lack of support to get the data, that became the runway to get off, which allowed her to have the political manoeuvring to, to to save face, which was very difficult to jump off. So then they're, they're not going to be very um, quick to jump back on. Well, she's, I would find that her would be very reluctant to jump back on. Yeah. So I think the political manoeuvring is a big part of it, even though this particular person wants to see it set in stone, as we all do. Um, it's, it's understanding how that works, um, which can also give you some comfort around, hmm. There, there, there was a premier who wanted to jump off well before that, that she actually did. And Bryce, I've got more to say about silly decisions that are happening in the Queensland market in my What's Making Property News. So you've got to stick around for that. because You're around. Another, All right. I like it. A, Good question, positive... Dean. Thank you for that. Hopefully yeah. that's helped. Um, check out the show notes. Um, we've got a wonderful team around here, so I'm sure we'll be able to find some links for that. Um, next one's from Travis, um, also emailed in, uh, and this is an out-of-pocket expenses to maintain an investment property. I think this is a really good question, Ben, because it... Mm -hmm gives a lot of um, uh, explanation to what a, a, it probably explains why property investing isn't for everyone, but let's um, let's have a, a little read through this and then we'll riff it towards the end. So, hi, gents. Hope you're well. My question of advice relates to out-of-pocket expenses for me to hold two investment properties because at the moment, after all costs and tax rebates, I'm around fifteen to $18,000 per annum out-of-pocket. I own a principal place of residence and have a Victorian and Queensland investment property. My more platform is up to date and has me in the surplus of $4,000 per month, but only at the moment. My issue is I don't see current benefits with the high out-of-pocket expenses, which are going to increase and a couple of costly expenses to address. 
on each property with water issues, one being a requirement to put in a pit drain to tackle stormwater, and the other, a fixed awning to combat heavy rain over a balcony, 4K and 3.5K respectively. With all this expense and the impact on quality of life due to concerns of having to pay for the next big costs, I wonder if it's even worth it. I've spoken with my advisor and informs me it's okay, but I wonder if this is sustainable or do I sell out for a more comfortable quality of living? I feel like I want to highlight that because I think <laughs> we're going to double back to that. I appreciate that there is some sacrifices, but fifteen dollars to $18,000 year on year with little prospect of that moving to a favourable portfolio holding, I just don't see. To add, there will be continuous improvements to spend in the coming years just to keep up with the age of the properties and keep them fresh. I don't feel rental increases will help the catch up. Please share your advice and thoughts. Ben. This is an awesome question. Um, so thank you, Travis, because it goes to the psychology of investing. <laughs> it goes to the psychology of the short, the medium, and the long-term aspects that challenge us um, every time we make a decision. And there are trade-offs in terms of those decisions that we make. And so where uh, Travis is currently challenged is in those short-term trade-offs. Like he can't see the wood between the trees. He's sitting back going, really? Um, I would feel a lot more comfortable um, if I didn't have this out-of-pocket expense um, because I'm just not seeing the momentum on a day-to-day -day basis that I would like to see in, in terms of the property portfolio, the two properties that have got. Now, we can't comment on the quality of those properties, so we just don't know what they look like. But I, what I can say is, you know, when he talks about, um, you know, I can't see this changing anytime soon, well, that's inconsistent with what would happen with properties over the medium to longer term. So the trade-off is really around looking at that short term. The other thing we don't have in terms of Travis's notes here is how much buffer does he have? So the 4,000 per month um, surplus, which is building up that buffer, um, doesn't feel like that's going up either because I'm going to get whacked with $4,000 to build the um, the new stormwater uh, drain issue. And I'm also got it three and a half thousand. So there's a couple of months where effectively I feel like I'm throwing money at these properties. And then I've got the ongoing maintenance on those properties as well. So this is the classic conundrum that investors face in terms of if I'm impatient and I can't see that future story, um, this is ultimately going to keep playing with my psychology. And if I don't feel comfortable with that, ultimately I'm going to pull the trigger and sell one of the properties. The irony here, Bryce, is usually they sell the better performing one <laughs> instead of the underperforming one because I, 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 because of the uh, sunk costs, um, you know, that's gone into it, right? And the loss aversion. So there's two heuristics and biases that we're talking about here. This is sunk cost and loss aversion, right? So the sunk cost and loss aversion means I will usually hold on to the poor, poorer performing investment and sell mm -hmm. the better one because I feel better about selling out because I've made a profit. Whereas the irony could be that that could have been a better property over the longer term and continue to outperform the poorer property. So there's, there's problems that usually households make under these current situations. And so I always say, let's go to the long-term aspects of this. If we are still in a comfortable financial position and if we understand delayed gratification and if we talk about, do I sell more for a more comfortable quality of living now? Yes. I can guarantee <laughs> you that there might be a substitution of that quality of living in the future if you don't plan to build out some wealth. So there is a lot going on here, mate. So yeah. I'll, I'll well, you, I mean, you picked up on a point that I think is important. The more comfortable quality of living, you, you yeah. choose it now and you choose it later. So that's that's important. What's missing for context here is we don't know the value of the properties no. because- if the properties are worth three hundred thousand dollars, um, fifteen to eighteen thousand against that is a number compared to what if what if the two assets are worth nine hundred each, or what if they're what if they're one point two million dollars each, right? So even at a low conservative, um, say a growth rate of six percent at higher values, the capital growth over the the ten year journey is generally significantly outweighing mm. the value of the the extra expenses, right? So that's that's one thing. Two, 
you also talked about the buffer because if you have a trading buffer that allows you to get through that. So, because I I understand property isn't linear; it doesn't go up the same amount. The six it's not six percent every year. I get that right, which is why time horizon is really important here. So, but I feel like that's that's really important because if we did have the context around the value of the two properties, that would help us give a uh, another view of what's going on here. But we've got surplus if we had a buffer. And depending on whether or not these these assets are actually um, A or B um, properties would make a difference here, um, depending on what we, we would suggest. So now I'm going to sound like a broken down record here, Ben, but in the absence of certainty, you generally um, let the anxiety um, gnaw away at you, right? So the way that you get certainty is you map it out and you build a roadmap and you have a look at the numbers and then you do some projections and you can make it you can make it conservative. So that's that's what I believe in my heart. That's what I would do. That's what you need. You need to see the numbers so that you can actually see if you can trade through. Because part of the planning of the numbers is you factor in, for us, it's 1.5% of the purchase price for maintenance. We don't suggest that property doesn't have ongoing maintenance. So we actually front foot that. We factor that in. We make sure that we're aware of the fact that there's going to be things that come up. Um, the bit where Travis says, not sure the rent, I don't feel rental increases will help the catch up. I'd actually prefer to to see if that's a true statement or not, um, because it might just be confirming how you're feeling around the anxiety that you've got right now. And some of the um, increase in interest rates that we're experiencing will have flow and effects to rents over time, but they're not happening straight away because there's a lag to that as well. So but I, my, my first, my first note that I wrote here, Ben, once I read this, um, went to this question is, this is why not all people are property investors, hmm. um, because there is a peace and a comfort that you need to have around what level of risk that you are prepared to um, have, what that actually means for you in terms of servicing debt, and being comfortable with zeros. Um, and being comfortable with um, a little bit of um, uncertainty that comes. Create the certainty through knowing the numbers, create the certainty through putting buffers in place and create the certainty through having a look into the future and a look around the corner to see what that'll look like. But in the absence of that, I can see where the uncertainty builds and I can see why the the um, the instinct is to make it go away um, so that we can have a more, more comfortable quality of living now. I'd want to know more about that if I was speaking to this person. Where is the pain showing up for you? Where is the 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 quality of living that you're experiencing right now? Where is the discomfort, and what does that look like? These are the sorts of things that I would love to lean in a bit more on this question. Now, evidence also suggests us that you know not everyone retires um, successfully, right? So if we actually think about it, um, it's significantly more people um, who will retire poorer because they didn't take economic action and didn't plan out that future, right? So if we just say, let's say a third, let's use a rough number, say a third of people who are going to take action, stay the course, they're, they're, they're ensuring their future. There's this middle third that, that basically get a little bit wobbly. And then there's a bottom third that effectively through poor decision-making, poor money management, they give themselves very little chance in the first instance in terms of being able to get there. Now, what Travis is demonstrating from a behavioral point of view is the classic wobble, right? It is the classic wobble in the sense that even though your advisor has told you that it should be okay, and potentially you're looking at the numbers, here's what's happening, Travis, and I'm talking to you without knowing the full story here, and I'm hopefully talking to the whole community, you don't believe it. You've got some blockers in terms of believing the story about future uh, wealth creation of property. So future... A well, uh, price appreciation in property, you're challenged on that view, right? You're looking at all of the data, you're looking at interest rates going up, you're reading all the current noise in the marketplace, and you're sort of saying, I'm apprehensive. And that is okay, right? Okay. This is coming from a no judgment point of view, but the, the but the evidence that supports the 20, 30, 40, 50 years returns on does not support your current feelings, Okay, does not support your current belief system. So ultimately, it's going to be about, well, what can we tell you that is going to move your belief system? Because if we can't do that, then ultimately you may make a decision that you will regret into 
the, into the future. Because that's ultimately, you know, remember what, what Bryce and I always talk about. When we interview new people or novices and then we see them and talk to them 10, 20, 30 years in the future, the biggest regrets they have is not taking action and not buying earlier, right? But you're in this messy middle bit right now where it, it doesn't feel like, okay, my property prices aren't going up. I've got all this cash burn that's going out. I can see that these assets are going to need future maintenance. I get it. I get why you're wobbly. But the question is ultimately going to come down to this decision is do you believe over the next decade to two decades to three decades that these property prices will increase in value consistent with what they've done over the last you know, 20, 30 or 40 years? Now, we don't know the assets. We don't know whereabouts they're located in terms of bigger cities or whatever. So that's a, that's a fair question to be asking yourself. But if we can't convince you of that and your belief system stays where it is, you will probably exit out of one of those assets or maybe even two of them. And if you do that, that's that's an informed decision that you're making. The question is, how informed is that decision? And will you regret that decision that you're ultimately making? Because from my point of view, everyone that I've spoken to who sold property 20 years ago always wish they'd owned those properties 100%. today. Always wish they'd owned those properties today. So that's, and, and so again, this is why I really um, respect Travis's vulnerability in sharing this question with us. Because you're not alone, mate. No. And you you can go and have a barbecue conversation. And I'm telling you, 80% of the people at that barbecue are probably going to concur with you. Yeah, yeah. No, you you want to you want to shore that up. And yeah, we don't know what's going to happen in the product. It's the 20%. It's that 20% or that third that I was talking about before who just don't listen to the noise and just get on with the program. And then ultimately they will sit back in 10. 20, 30 years, and they'll be thanking their their former self in making that good decision. And I've, I've mentioned this before about a, a really great bottle of Cab Sav, haven't I, Bryce? Yeah. A really heavy bottle of Cab Sav. If you, 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 you got, you're going to have to shelve it. You're going to have to basically let it sit because if you try and drink that too new um, and try and sell it or get rid of it too new, it's going to be a horrible experience. But if you let it sit and age and let the you know let let the marketplace do the heavy lifting. Let the gross domestic production. Let the economy keep growing as all of those things continue to keep happening. You're ultimately going to see land appreciation, and that's ultimately where you're going to get that future capital growth return. And and again, that's hard to see because it's 10, 20, 30, 40 years away. But if you just sit on them, and then all the rents do start to cover everything, there is a tipping point in terms of the debt levels that you have. It all becomes positively geared at some point in time. All of that is also true. Um, well, it's based in evidence. So, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of future, there's no guarantees. You know, like anything, investment carries risk. There's no guarantees. But if we're looking at the past performance, we've got a fairly good idea that's evidence-based that suggests that uh, those properties will appreciate over time. And you'll be thankful in 20 or 30 years' time, even if you have to sell one of them then um, to pay out the debt or whatever that looks like. So I'd be sort of saying, go back to your advisor and, and have a conversation around, why don't I believe? Like, what else can you tell me that might change my opinion um, that will allow me to believe and, and hang in for the longer term? Yeah, just outwork your doubt. That's, yes. that's outwork the doubt. Just go, Love and, get it. Some, go and get some certainty. Because the conversation that, that you're often having uh, with property investors, Ben, is it's, it, it's not risk-free, otherwise everyone would do it. So yep. all you're doing is mitigating risk. And so um, you put in place ways to mitigate risk. And part of that is being really clear on the numbers. So I'm with you, mate. Travis um, has, I think you'll be surprised how many people are actually have a similar um, yep. thought process at the very least. Some people are having conversations with others. Some people are using your, at least, you've, at least you've still got action, right? Some people are actually using your thought process for reasons to never, never get in. Um, mm. Mr. and Mrs. Wait and see. Um, and versus Mr. and Mrs. Do it now. We used to, it's a um, anecdote we used to use way back twenty years ago, Ben. But um, yeah, good question, Travis. Hopefully that's given you some uh, some help, and hopefully that's helped other people who may be able to resonate with you. Third question here is from Rose, and it's a question on paying investment loans. Hi Ben and Bryce, this is Rose, and I love the podcast, and have really enjoyed the personal stories in your summer series. I've never heard of financial anorexia before, but I definitely have it. So I was wondering if you could give me some guidance. I bought a small investment property in August 2021. 
I had a lucky guess that interest rates were going up sooner rather uh, sooner than the RBA was suggesting, and I fixed the whole loan at a lower rate than the bank offered for the variable. However, this means I don't have an, off an offset account and I'm only allowed to pay off an extra up to limited amount per year. This is an investment loan and the property is positively geared. I've heard old adages about how you shouldn't pay off investment loans because they're tax deductible, but the saver in me wants to pay down the loan. So I'm asking you two as experts, should I still pay off extra on my property investment loan now while I have a low rate for a few years or just keep paying back the minimum and invest the extra money elsewhere? Now, before I go to you, Ben, um, financial anorexia, that's a thing. It is a type of spending disorder. Um, people who suffer from the eating disorder of anorexia may obsess about food and the number on the scale. Um, people who suffer from a financial disorder may obsess about money and the number on their statements. So for those who are suffering, and, and it is indeed suffering from financial anorexia, they've never believed they have enough to enjoy what they've got. So just so people think we're not being cute with that term, because um, health uh, you know, anorexia mm. is very important, but that is a real thing. And secondly, Ben, in episode 398, um, you and I spoke to Jack um, about uh, going from financial anorexia to financial peace of mind. So we'll put a, a link um, just to double down on that if anyone's interested in this topic. But Ben, um, uh, should should you pay investment loans? So the answer to that, and again, it's it's hard to sort of know the full story here um, for, for this particular client in terms of Rose. So there's a couple of things going on. Um, in theory, I don't have a problem um, with people paying lump sums of money onto um, investment debt if there is no um, owner-occupied debt attached to that, right? So that's what we don't understand here. So um, in most cases with fixed loans, um, it's usually five to $10,000 in additional repayments before you start getting penalties. So if we're talking about $10,000 each calendar year um, or every 12 months, Again, I don't see that being a problem, generally speaking, because you're reducing the debt, you're building the LVR, and then ultimately, it's going to put you in a position to potentially use that equity to add to your portfolio down the track. So, um, you know, is Rose a rent vester? Is she also looking to eventually buy her own or occupied home? So yes, that money would be better um, parked on an offset account against their principal place of residence over the medium to longer term. but. I'm not, you know, if if this money's um, you want it to 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 do more work for you, that is definitely an option for you. And and at that sort of level of five or ten thousand per annum, it's not super material that would worry me in terms of being able to do that. If I had had the benefit of hindsight, like all of us would have, um, this is a, a timely reminder to our community um, that when you are looking at fixed rates. Um, we would also look to say, well, why don't you split and have a portion of variable and a portion of fixed? And the best way to do that is to assess how much surplus cash you believe you're going to be able to generate over the course of the fixed rate period. So uh, by way of example, if we're going to be fixing for three years and over that three years, we're anticipating that we're going to be able to generate $60,000 of surplus cash what I would have done if I had been the broker would have proposed this idea of sort of saying, well, why don't we have a variable rate of say uh, uh, 75,000 split? So just give that little bit of extra. And then that way we can park all of those savings that we're making over here and then lock away the rest of it into a fixed rate loan over this side. And then ultimately now, and now whether I was right or wrong and the math turns out that um, you could have been a couple of hundred dollars better off by having all of it fixed and paying the extra into the loan. Remember, we're playing a long game here, right? So you're not going to be, you're not going to perfectly execute every time. Um, and you shouldn't beat yourself up about not perfectly executing each time because one could argue that, yes, by me having that uh, variability, I might have been able to put some of that money into the share market and got a good return, or I could have put a lot of that money into the share market and got absolutely whacked like what's happened in the last 12 months in the markets. So it's it's all guesswork. It's all based on assumptions. Um, but more broadly, what I am saying to you, Rose, is don't beat yourself up about that. But if I was you and that money, uh, you want to be working harder for you, investing it elsewhere at the moment, um, there's a lot of uncertainty out in the market. Um, thinking 
into that next two or three year time frame. And, and again, I'm no equities expert, but it's very clear to us in terms of um, the way in which the markets are responding currently. And that is, in, they're actually going up. Equity markets are actually performing quite well in these last four weeks, um, you know, certainly at time of recording. And that's because they're thinking about returns from those businesses in two to three to four years time. So even though some of those businesses, especially the um, the technology business have come off as much as 90% in some cases, horrible, um, you know, corrections in their valuations. So no one really knows, right, in terms of what's going to happen in that particular space, whereas paying off debt as a principal theory is actually good. So if it's five or 10 grand um, per annum over the course of a couple of years, not knowing what your future holds, because if you if you do need to have some money for change over a car or something like I'd prefer you to do a cash transaction on a change over a car rather than borrowing that money, because that's going to impact your um, borrowing power in terms of what's next for you as well. But in theory, uh, parking money in there and being able to release it out for future purposes via equity, not a bad thing. I don't think you should be um, too critical of yourself. I think importantly, we need to put a disclaimer in here, folks. So, you know, all Ben's giving you is suggestions to have a think about and go and talk to your advisor as well. But there's a couple of things too, um, just to, to lean in on why Ben was saying you'd go the variable is because the whole idea is not to change the purpose of the loan. So if you're actually able to go that variable section, have an offset account against, it means that you're effectively reducing the interest, but still have control of the cash. And when you do use the cash for something else, it's not impacting the loan. Whereas if you pay down the loan, if for whatever reason it was a redraw, you could actually get it back somehow in the future. It means you change the nature of the loan. The other thing to think about too is whether you would salary sacrifice into super, for example, um, with that extra cash. So, but it's it's a risk profile thing. It's an opportunity cost thing, and it's also a faith in the the asset class thing um, going forward. So, I'm not sure I can add too much more to what Ben said, other than um, uh, there's a few things for you to think about there and. Hopefully you lean into your um, licensed professional advisor to help you with that question, but just a couple of things to think about. Final question for us today, Ben, is from Kay. I didn't get um, the full name, but it's Kay. Um, Using equity, the now or never mentality. So here's the question. Hey, gents, 30-something female listener here from Sydney and a big fan of all your work. You made lockdown livable. Thank you. While I've met with one of your team already, I have to say I'm finding taking the plunge my biggest challenge. My partner and I will be having a baby within a year and have some modest rainy day savings in our offset, which took a few years to build. We purchased our home in late 2020 and also have an investment property, which is a unit in Sydney purchased in 2018. We now have a window of opportunity to use the equity in our home and investment property to buy our next investment and scale up. I know in a recent Q&A episode, you talked about borrowing capacity for some, decreasing over time and becoming a tad harder. Plus, the mortgage environment will be generally more challenging with interest rate hikes, et cetera. I'm not afraid of the macro changes going on in the world too much, but the ultimate question is this. Do we strike while the iron is hot or do we wait? The challenges ahead aren't small. In brackets, new human, new human on the way, parental leave considerations, reduced income, rising interest rates, et cetera. Please help. Kay from Sydney. Thank you, Kay, for this question. It's a it's another one of those classic, what should I do next type questions. Um, and it sounds like there is some capacity there. Now, that may have been impacted by recent rate rises uh, from the time of writing to the time of um, hearing this question being broadcast. And that may have changed things in terms of just the sort of level of capacity that might have been available to you in terms of what you can buy. Um, it may sound a little bit like a broken record here, but for me, it's it's really simple. I try and take out the guesswork, right? So I try and look at the long-term outcomes and I try and take out the guesswork of trying to predict the market. I know in my share investing, Bryce, I'm bloody horrible at it. Mm. Like in terms of like, I don't know what it is. I'm almost jinx at any share that I buy, even though I'm looking at the fundamentals of the business. For some reason, I find a share that's going to go backwards or sit idle for a while. Right, so you should write a newsletter, Ben. We can all short the ones that you're buying. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but but I come back to these principles. Our property is a long-term investment. We're going to talk more about this in terms of how you judge 
properties performance, you know, as an ultimate weighing machine versus a voting machine, you know, so we're going to use some of those principles in an upcoming episode. But what I will talk to you about here is exactly this point. It's like, if I'm, if could, could I pick the market? Can I be precise and perfectly detect what's going to happen? Well, you've heard from some of my RBA and, and economic updates recently is that, you know, the best if forecasters, the big banks were forecasting the cash rate wouldn't go over three. Now, most of them have got it over three and it could be going higher. So even with the best you know, knowledge and the most data, um, you can still get forecasts wrong. And so on the, in the short term, but over the long term, there's a smoothing effect in terms of decisions that you make. And so I always make the judgment calls and it's worked very well for me. I only have the one mistake in my investment, property investment portfolio, and that was I sold one of my properties. Everything else I've done, in theory, has been pretty good. Um, if I look at the, you know, the compounding returns and the annual returns on the assets that I've bought, I'm extremely happy with the performance of the assets that I've bought over the journey. But I've always bought them for a long-term play. And what I've done is taken out this risk of timing the market because what I've done is I've worked out my cash flows, I've worked out what, what I can comfortably afford, and then I'm saying I'm in a position to now do something and not leave money on the table and make my money work harder for me, and I just executed. And I executed to an end goal in mind. And so that, that's the best advice I can give to anyone in our community, and that is you are playing the long game. This is basically a, a, a lifestyle by design. It is planning to become what you plan to become. And it's based on the future you, right? It's ultimately about, you know, this is this is a rest of life strategy. So so I, I wouldn't be too caught up in the, in, in the short term. Now, with the current increases in interest rate, has that put a lot more pressure on the house? That's going to answer your question. So all you're doing is deferring that purchase so let's say there was a plan purchase done as part of your sequencing and the, the, the interest rates you're paying today have gone up to a point where it's now sensible not to do anything. It's sensible just to sit and wait. So for that, for that, that's a prudent measure. But for others, you know, which is what I said in my latest economic update, for others, this is an opportune moment. Their, their, their position might be, they might be in the tech industry or in the health industry, their salaries might have just gone up 20 or 30%. They might be stretch. So these little extra eleven hundred dollars a month in repayments mean nothing to them. They're clearing five, six, eight thousand dollars a month in surplus income, and they've got equity in their current home. They're the ones who are making the wrong decision by not doing anything now. They're the ones who will be regretful of making that decision, and they're avoiding the you know taking out the noise of the perfect timing in the market. Even if you know their properties retract five percent from this moment in time, they they get the bottom. They're guaranteed to get the bottom and they're guaranteed to get the full 100% of the upside in that next cycle of growth in the phase. So I think it's important to understand that. And I think from, from Kay's point of view out of Sydney, thank you for the question, Kay, because it allows me to remind people that play the long game, um, look at your current situation, maybe defer things. But if you don't have a plan and you're thinking, well, I'll, I'm just juggling all these things around, remember, make the invisible visible, Right. You know, you can't be what you can't see. And so if there's an opportunity there to take action and plan that out, and a perfect plan can still be adjusted, like a good budget sometimes still gets adjusted. The federal government released a mid-year budget because they want to set a new agenda, a new pathway. So it's not set in concrete, but what it does do is it shows you the pathway forward really clearly and the potential of what you're about to achieve. So I'm a, I'm a big believer in planning. Um, and not only a big believer in it, I practice what I preach. Hundred percent. So there's a couple of things, there's a couple of things here, Ben. They bought their home in late 2020. That's that's prime lockdown. Um, yep. Don't know what's happening. Congratulations. The... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so the trend, if they, it looks like they bought in Sydney. Um, I, can't, I don't know the PPR. They said they got their unit in Sydney, but they're from Sydney actually. So yeah. So they would have they would have seen some enormous growth, and then they purchased the unit that they've got, which was two years earlier in 2018. So Chances are, in their own experience, the trend has been their friend. Property is yeah. going up. So if you have that thesis um, that property goes up, well, then the the fact that you could have got a better asset the earlier you got in with these changes would have been better. 
would have been most beneficial to. But we understand there's um, there's a new, to quote, there's a new human on the way, there's parental leave consideration, yeah. there's reduced income and rising interest rates. So to give people a little look behind the curtain here, Ben, when, we, when we're going into our um, uh, advisory mode with our team, there's three key dials on the dashboard that they're looking at. There's one graph that shows uh, over time, over so if I try and get this for an audio audience, over a period of time, there's an income um, graph and a corresponding expenses. And so what you can see when you see that is you can see where there's gaps, where there's significant gaps where income is greater than expense. And you can see if there's any time where the expense is greater than income, right? So that's one, one uh, dial. The second dial we have is household liquidity, right? So it shows how much is actually in access to the household, typically through offset accounts. But so it shows so that they can r- remain liquid. And then the third one is the LVR or the global LVR to see what the loan to valuation ratio is across the portfolio. These things are three very insightful um, dials because what it's doing is it's munching up a whole heap of information that is their life in the background and shows you on three very clear dials what's going on. Is there an opportunity to buy now? Yes or no? That would also factor in um, when you're going on paid parental leave, um, when you've got other people coming on the way and the extra expenses that you've got, um, any reduced income. So it factors all that in. Then, then you'll see during those times what actually happens. And again, we're on audio and I'm using my hands here, Ben, but then you actually see any dips in household cash flow because in some yeah. situations, the household cash flow does actually go backwards. But as long as you don't go below the the you run out of money and get into red line territory so that you can trade your way through it. And then uh, overall, you're trying to actually see that that global LVR, A, is in a range that's realistic to see whether you can buy, but but. But B, you're trying to make sure that that's trending down over time. They're, they're three very insightful things. And I think if everyone can see those three things, that's where the invisible becomes visible. That's where you start to see ah, oh, all the anxiety, all the monsters under the bed, all the things that we've talked about, Ben, just in three simple graphs, you get to see it straight away. And all of a sudden, you get to make decisions on the questions that are being asked here. And if you still have the thesis that, the trend is still your friend and it's going up here and you've got the, a long enough time horizon. Just seeing those three things will actually help you make decisions. You could go, yes, no, maybe, There's, but it's super clear. It's not should I, should know what would happen, what would happen if I make a mistake and leaving lots of um, uncertainty around the mystery of not knowing those things. If I can build on that and talk back to Travis's question about um, the out-of-pocket, um, what also the modelling does you know, when we're sitting down with the clients is... We can have a look at a property in isolation and have a look at when each property is going from negative to positive. And we can also have a look at the global portfolio in terms of when that whole, whole global portfolio turns from negative to positive, including that offset balances. That That is, I think there's not, well, I'm not aware of any other software solution in the market that does that type of modeling. There's definitely some wonderful, simple PIA software from Jan and Ian Summers, which is always what I grew up on in my right. first, you know, when I was a novice and first learning the craft. But now with, you know, in terms of the models that we build, you've got to factor in the benefit of that cash sitting in those offsets, because that is ultimately reducing the interest costs associated with that as well. And then you've got to combine your um, accumulation property investment portfolio with also your principal place of residence and the debt we've got on that. And that's why it's the, the munging of all of that information that brings out this idea that I can't be what I can't see. Well, you can see it, right? And then we have the ability to set the variables. And so we usually set the variables at a conservative level to show that there is also buffer in terms of when interest rates start to come back up and those types of things happen. But you can also, if you wanted to, well, take all those buffers out and just give me a real-time line of sight in terms of what that looks like. So that's the luxury you have with sophisticated software modeling and and you know simulation modeling right but that that should then you know coming back to Travis's point about not believing that should give you some confidence to believe that okay well all right you factored that in you've made those concessions okay I can see you've allowed me for maintenance and holding cost um and in Kay's case oh, okay I can see you've you know, put me on maternity leave and and you're returning me to two days a week uh, for the first year and then four days a week after that as Bubs gets a little bit older. So that's the plan of what we're trying to do. Yeah, all of those things are factored into your cash flow modeling, which is what you were referring to earlier, Bryce, in terms of those um, gauges, those indicators in terms of what's possible. And and that that builds confidence. 
And I, I can't undersell that enough to sort of say to people, without that, I, I was, you know, my story goes really simple to, I had financial anorexia when I was younger. I worried about money. I looked after money. I came from a household that was very conservative and spending money. So it's taken me basically a lifetime building up a new mindset, a new level of confidence. But even in my early 30s, um, when Jane and I were sitting about adding to our portfolio, I didn't have line of sight on that. And by not having line of sight on that, I was too conservative. I could, my portfolio could be double the size that it is today. Right, mm. but I we set a target that was basically going to supplement our income very comfortably, and coming back again to Travis's point, the trade off that Travis might might have here is that an earlier retirement or a standard of living today versus a standard of living tomorrow that could be compromised by some of those decisions that are being made. Now it's all again calculated guesswork. Um, there is not a perfect science. Um, as part of that, but you try and give yourself the best opportunity where you turn the probability in your favour. And if you think that, okay, it's it's evidence-based, it's historical-based, all of those things come true, then hopefully, hopefully all going well without any critical black swan events or things like that, which you should you can't plan for. So you should never factor them into any. Well, none plan. of the black swan events in the past we could have planned for. So no. why would we expect we can do that in the future? No, that's right. But you can also tweak your plan, like, and that's why you build buffers in. And so, in Kay's case, if if that buffer is not adequate, then we're going to sit on the sidelines, Kay. We're absolutely going to sit on the sidelines. But you know that you put that beyond doubt because you've actually done the modelling and you've got those cash flow numbers. And when your situation changes, you come back, you tweak your model, and away you go. You get back on. You get back in the game. Very good. So there you go, folks. Hopefully that uh, has been beneficial to you as well. Now, some of, some of the, the basics of just knowing what your numbers are too, you can get that um, by, by using the more platform and have a little line of sight on what you're doing as well. Money stretch, money fit as well, um, which can help. So I just want to thank our contributors today, Ben. Uh, so Travis, Rose and Kay, as in the letter K. Not sure uh, any letters after that, but thank you for writing in and letting us know hopefully that's been beneficial to each and everyone who's been listening hey my life hack today ben is um this will come as a surprise to you ben but i use an iphone so and i i use the calculator a lot on my iphone do you use the calculator a lot ben on your I do. iphone I, 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 i'm a calculator man so remember back in the it. 90s when we were in high school ben or you might, might have been in the 70s for you but um oh no the 80s i better be more generous but um <laughs> Uh, we remember we had those scientific calculators. We had to go and get them and take them to school. Whereas now you've got a scientific calculator in your iPhone if you just turn it sideways. That's not my life hack today. If you're typing in <laughs> something using your calculator and you've made a mistake, Ben. So oh, let's yeah. say I put 98.54 and I, I, damn, I need it to 98.53. All I need to do is swipe the number to the left and it'll actually remove the most recent number and then I can put three in. Do you know how you normally have to get clear, clear and start again? Yep, yep. Just swipe the number. Swipe Ooh. and it moved. It just to the moves left. the last entry, Ooh. right to left, right, right to, left. to left. Okay, check that out, folks, because I use the calculator a lot, and sometimes I've got fat fingers and make the wrong number, and then uh, I need to start again. So check that out, folks, if you are using the iPhone as a calculator. Ooh, hey Ben, what's like making it. property news? Well, I mentioned earlier about some, you know, maybe there's too much sun happening up in Queensland, Bryce. Nope. especially in the Cairns, far north Queensland market. Mm. Um, Matt reached out to me um, through my picker uh, email address. Um, and I have, a, I have a, a townhouse up in Cairns as well as in the self-managed super fund up there. And I also got the letter um, from the council of Cairns. Yeah. Guess what they're doing, Bryce? Free trips out under the reef? I wish, but um, no, that's not <laughs> what they're doing. Right. They're going to regrade property investment uh, real estate in Cairns to a higher rates grading. Oh, right. So here's another classic case. So <laughs> Cairns Council, they're basically saying that you're now, if you own a residential property that is an investment property, we're going to make you pay higher rates in mm. Cairns. And I'm like, well, now what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to contact all of the property managers up there and write to all of the tenants to say, we're really sorry, but the Cairns Council is the reason why your rents are going up 
because yes. ultimately they want to charge us more for exactly no additional benefits. Like ultimately, yeah. you don't mind paying more, Bryce, if you get more. Like yeah. if, if does that mean our tenants get to go to an exclusive Great Barrier Reef uh, tour because we're paying more as as investors? No, no, it doesn't mean that. It just means that they get they're going to try and grab more money off us mm. because they think that property investors have more money. So what are the consequences for Cairns? Now, Cairns has been a market that has underperformed. You know, from a broader property perspective, they've mm-hmm. got great yields up there, amazing yields, but even replacement value, the cost of, and don't even start me on the insurance bills that are that are up there at the moment. There is a there is a massive problem um, with properties that are exposed to major weather events, and that has put basically it's pretty much tapped out most of the. Uh, of the ability for people who have body corporates or owners corporations up there. There's only one company that provides insurances. And by law, you actually have to have insurance. Right. So, oh, you know, on, it's it's well, it's outrageous. I can I, I'll give you an example of our property, bro. The um the uh, insurance policy from three years ago when I was sitting on the on the board there, the the, the body corporate um has gone from I think from memory it was $34,000. It's now $65,000. Wow. So, so the government's stepping in and they're building a sort of a, a pooling of insurances to try and reduce that claim down. But here's the, here's the council going, sorry, everyone, we don't want property investors up here. So if you're thinking about moving up to Cairns, don't worry about coming up to Cairns because we can't put you into any accommodation here anyway. So tourism operators, sorry, we can't bring the backpackers in to help you build your businesses and all the restaurant operators who who obviously help with the experience, the overall experience of returning to Cairns. Don't worry about that. People are going to say that it's, it's poor service up there. Don't worry about going up there and you get less money in your community. Just stupidity, Bryce, stupidity on the highest mm. level. So obviously we're going to have to write to the council and our Queensland yeah. State Advisory Council are going to have to take the charge on this one because mm-hmm. it's obviously a localised issue. But if anyone who has property in Cairns or living up there, reach out to me, uh, bkingsley at picker.asn.au, my email address. I'm going to put you in contact um, with our Queensland State Advisory Council up there for Picker. And we're just going to have to fight another fight to sort of say this is just silly but it just goes to show that everyone thinks that property investors, uh, they're good for it. They, mm. You know, the greedy property investors, they're good for it. They've got plenty of money. Mm. You know, they've got, they got investments. But unfortunately, it goes to the tenants who has to pay it. Yeah. So it's just not on. Um, they need to find other ways of either reducing their spending up there um, or be fairer um, rather than just coming after re- reclassifying the grade that I get absolutely no benefit. I'm happy to pay for good parks, um, you know, barbecue facilities, good toilet facilities. I love, you know, the the water park that they've got there in the city area. It's amazing. We're taking our family up there. We've holidayed up there. And if that, but now rent uh, landlords have to pay more for those privileges in that market. It's just ludicrous. Um, so there's my little rant in terms. Yeah, of lucky there's uh, lucky there is a a peak uh, board to um, advocate for property investors. And if only people could see what I could see, Ben, you had this wonderful little megaphone thing going with your hands as you were. Hopefully, doing it, that. hopefully it changed the sound of. It the did change the sound a bit, so, but it's it's lost unless you get to uh, sort of paint the picture of what was going on there. But um, oh, very, very good. good. So that's what's making property news. All right, well it's a big show, mate. We've got through um, some awesome questions from our community. Keep them coming, folks. Uh, keep them coming. Um, go to go to the website, thepropertycouch.com.au. There is a little button, speak pipe. We want to hear your voice. Those were written questions, and we haven't done some written for a while, Ben. So I thought we'd make sure we get to those people. But speak pipe is is where the jam is for everyone to go. So again, thank you for those people that have contributed. But uh, mate, until next week, knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. Well said. See you next week, folks. Hey guys, Bryce here again. Just want to catch you before you go and let you know, if you're new to our community, there are a lot of episodes to catch up on, but it's really important that you start from the very beginning at episode number one, because episode one through to 20 share all of the foundational pillars and frameworks that you need to know to get the best out of listening to this podcast. So I'd recommend that you start there. And the little tip is to maybe start on one and a half speed. Now, for those of you that are time poor and don't have time to go back from the beginning, don't worry, we've got you covered as well. 
because we've created a binge guide that goes through all of the details and makes it easy for you to read and get up to speed very, very quickly. So if you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash fast track, you will be able to download that binge guide and you will be up to speed in no time. And whilst you're there, I've got a few extra goodies for you because we have our top five frameworks that you'll learn on this podcast, as well as the Make Money Simple Again ebook, which will help you with the foundations of basic money management so you'll have everything you need to succeed in building your own lifestyle design and getting the best out of this podcast. Now, just a reminder that anything that we cover on this podcast is not considered financial advice. We certainly recommend that you get your unique circumstances looked at by your individual advisor and everything we talk about is just general in nature. But folks, I wanna encourage you again to go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash fast track and you can go and get all those goodies and catch up right away.